All right, if you take your Bible tonight, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. As you're finding your place there in 2 Corinthians 7, we uh, do have our VBS coming up on us pretty quickly, and we enjoyed having the Neighborhood Bible Time team last year for the first time. And, of course, we're having them back, and we did find that the program works well, but just like we've always done with our BBS, it takes workers. They, they run the program for us, but we do need some help, and I really would like to have gotten that. It just kind of sneaked up on us. We got, could have had the list out a little earlier, so if we'll jump on that quickly, and we'll have a meeting and tell you how you can help us and be involved in that, and I certainly trust it'll be a, a fruitful time for us. As you find your place in 2 Corinthians 7, I'm going to read there in just a moment. And as you find that place, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, how we thank you tonight that we can be in this service. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you for the anticipation of having the Lord's Supper tonight. We pray that what we would do tonight would uh, prepare our hearts as well as send out the message of the gospel, challenge the heart of the believer, that everything we do would bring honor to your name. We'll look to you to work in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. We finished the chapter uh, last time in chapter 6 which ties directly into chapter 7 so I go back and I pick up the last two verses of chapter 6 if you look at chapter 6 and verse 17 it says wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you so here's the exhortation that we talked about in the previous chapter uh, that the unbeliever has no communion with the believer and that we're not to be unequally yoked. We're to take this separated position. Because if you do, in verse 18, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So having these promises, that is, come out from among them, be ye separate, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Now, I think we understand tonight, if we are, uh, have an understanding of the gospel and how the, uh, the walk with the Lord Jesus Christ really works, we do not become separated to try to achieve salvation. But because we are saved, because we have received the Lord Jesus Christ, because we came as sinners with no hope of heaven and trusted Him, He changed us, He made us new, but now we're exhor exhorted to live that exalted position. That is, if we will live... A separated position will match what God already did on the inside. He is telling us here, having these promises, knowing that there is a blessing associated with walking with God with a separated walk. Because again, these Corinthians, they had had some real issues when he writ, wrote to them the first time. Now, of course, he's got his critics there, and he defends himself, his apostleship with his critics. But he's reminding those that are faithful. He's saying there's a reason for this. There is something behind it. And, of course, the context of chapter 7, you'll see that as we get into this, he's going to talk about the purity of both the church and the individual. You see, the individual believer is not living holy in order to achieve heaven. But we are citizens of heaven. That is, we already know we're headed there because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, so we ought to live like children of the King. That is, we ought to live a life that is different, that is separated, that is apart from what this world does. And that happens, of course, as we grow as believers, as God confronts us with truth. So here we find what God uses this little phrase, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You know, uh, a believer is more powerful when he's holy. Now, I, I say he's more powerful. The world doesn't understand what the Christian means when he says power. The world looks at power as authority. The world looks at power as an exalted position, or maybe I have something over someone else. As the Christian, the power we seek is less of us and more of Him. That is, we seek to be empowered by the Holy Spirit Himself, which means we get out of the way. See, the way it works is when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we get the joy, we get the fulfillment, we get the blessing, the satisfaction of knowing that we're used of God but God actually receives all the glory. So we need God's power. Do you know as an individual is more powerful when he's holy? Let me tell you that a church is more powerful when it's holy. You know the church today, uh, no doubt there's some with the philosophy of saying, well, in order to, to have a bigger 
influence, a bigger outreach, a bigger group, more numbers, whatever it might be. If we'll lower the standard, we'll reach more people. I say if we raise the standard, we'll let God reach some people. Now, that's where the power is. We perfect holiness in the fear of God. Very quickly, let's look through this. And we notice, first of all, in verse 1, I see what I'm going to call a regulation. The regulation is let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You know, that's really what holiness practically is. Now, I'll remind you again that I've already been made 100% perfectly holy in the sight of God. You know, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So in the sight of God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we sing about it tonight, because of the blood that he shed, because he rose from the dead, when I received him, God didn't begin a process of making me holy on the inside. He cleansed me. I am righteous before God. That's not braggadocious. That's simply believing what God said. I look just like I did before I got saved. I mean, if, if a person today trusted Christ, uh, they, just as soon as they trusted Christ, they'd get up outwardly, they'd look like the same person, but inwardly, they're not just patched up, they're not just improved, they've been made completely new. Now, when that person is made new, what does God exhort us to do now? He says in 1 Peter 1.16, As I, the Lord God, am holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We serve a holy God. The regulation is to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You know what that is? That's just old-fashioned spiritual discipline and holiness in our life. It starts with the flesh. You know there's some habits in our flesh that need to go when we're a Christian? God is concerned about what we say. It matters to God if we use four-letter words and innuendos and sound just like the world in our speech. That ought to go. Uh, it, God is concerned about how we entertain ourselves. The world's not. They have no uh, really uh, hold back. They don't hold back at all in what they would entertain themselves. They use the uh, legal ground. Well, if you're old enough, you know, if you're 14, you can watch this. If you're 17, you can watch this. Hey, if it's not honoring to God at any age, I ought not be entertained by it. God is concerned about how I'm entertained. God is concerned about my... Uh, my temper. God is concerned about my attitude. All of these things that outwardly we see, God's concerned about. But you know what else he's concerned about? He's concerned about my spirit. He's concerned about not just, hey, I might have every uh, T crossed right and every I dotted correctly as a Christian. I might have the 10 top standards listed for the Baptist and say, boy, if I do that, I'm a good Baptist. Dress like this, talk like this, have these habits and hobbies. And all of those may be correct and biblical, but you can do every one of those and be far from God. Have pride in your heart, jealousy, backbiting, a gossiping tongue, a rotten attitude. God says perfected in the flesh and spirit. That's the regulation. Now that belongs to the context of chapter 6, but it introduces the rest of this chapter. Because after he introduces the regulation, he picks up the narrative again. You know, he's been talking about this through these chapters and been addressing the Corinthian church and talking about uh, what happened, why he was there, and so forth. So he picks that up again in verse 2. And he noticed now we, we're going to see a pattern of not only the regulation, he introduced that, but now there's a pattern of rejoicing. In verse 2 he says, Receive us, we have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and to live with you. Now notice verse 4, because here is his... His point he's getting to, he says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Now, even as Paul wrote this epistle, he was in the midst of difficulty. We don't know which one. You know, just pick your, uh, pick your poison when it comes to his uh, difficulties. It might have been one of the times he was shipwrecked. Maybe it was one of the times he was in the deep. Maybe he had just been beaten with rods. Maybe he had uh, just recently been stoned at Lystra. Uh, maybe it was one of the times where he was uh, fought with the beast at Ephesus. I don't know which one of these, but all of those are documented that Paul had been through all these difficulties and tribulations. Uh, it, maybe it was one of the stays he had in jail. I mean, he's the only person who had a rewards card for the local jail when he would go to the different towns and so forth. 
you say, man, he must have been a criminal. You know what he was guilty of? He was guilty of preaching the gospel. Now, Paul had some trouble, but he says, you know what? In the midst of my trouble, I have comfort, and I'm exceeding joyful. Now, the joy that he had was not incidental. In fact, you'll notice in this passage, he's joyful in the midst of tribulation. Look down to verse uh, 7. He says, and not by his coming, talking about Titus, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent, fervent mind, so that I rejoiced the more. So he's already says, I'm rejoicing in my tribulation. He tells him when Titus came, he got more fired up, more rejoicing. He says in verse 9, it wasn't just in the past. He says, now I rejoice. And then you go to verse 13. He says, therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus. And then he ends the chapter in chapter 16. I rejoice, therefore, and I have confidence. You know, I get the impression that Paul had some joy. Now, he writes with this theme, with this uh, message to these people. Though he's in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation and difficulty, he says, look, you folks have given me some thrill, some joy. There is a, a comfort that is associated with what he's about to share. And I want you to see what it is he's excited about. You know what he's excited about? He's excited that these people, he didn't know. You think about the letter that was written. He couldn't just look on Facebook and see what kind of response they had to his letter. He couldn't just uh, wait for an email to come in. He couldn't even wait for the postal service to send him something. He had to wait for an individual to tell him about it. Now, he rejoiced when he got the news that the church had responded properly. You know, what, what basically happened, and we see this in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, there were many problems in the Corinthian church. Paul knew those problems were there, and he had already written them one epistle. Now he hears about all these problems. For instance, the division. They were going to law with one another. But it appears that the biggest issue, and the one that he really wrote the letter for from a human standpoint, was this one man who was in gross immorality, and the church wasn't bothered by it. Matter of fact, they even got puffed up about it. You know what it almost looks like? The church was saying this. They're saying, well, look. We've got a man in our church who's living in gross immorality, and we're such loving, kind uh, people and so generous that we actually feel like we're pretty much a, uh, more spiritual than anyone else. These other churches, they deal with sin. Hey, we're, we're all open, encompassing, and accepting of everybody, and they got puffed up, and Paul, the apostle, wrote and says, wait a minute. Yes, Jesus forgives, but this man claims to be a Christian, and you ought to know I wrote unto you an epistle, don't company with fornicators. Are you going to deal with sin? You'll help the man more if you do it. Certainly the purity of the church is at stake. And he wrote that epistle in 1 Corinthians, and that seems to be, from what he's saying, one of his main reasons for writing when he wrote. Well, now, he wrote this letter, and then as he writes it, he realizes it was pretty strong. So what I notice now is I see after he had mentioned his joy, he lets us know that he had a reconsideration. He recollects this story. Look back, if you would, in uh, verse 9. He says, now I rejoice. Now, the indication is maybe he wasn't before. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrow. In fact, let me back you up to verse 8 to get the context here. He says, though I made you sorry with a letter. That's the letter we just talked about. I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were before a season. Now I rejoice. You know what Paul did? He wrote this letter. Now, he wrote under inspiration of God. But even so, God in his dealing with the apostle Paul, when Paul would write, God, of course, would undertake and give him the words to say. But God allowed him to write in providence. He was, he was provoked by what was going on at Corinth. So he wrote this letter, and he realized after he wrote it, Boy, that's a strong letter. I mean, I really got on to him. He gave it to the messenger. The messenger took it. There's no turning back. I mean, he knew it was gone now. They're going to read it. And it took a, a number of weeks for, some, for them to receive the letter. And he pictured in his mind, this man's going to stand. We have a letter from the Apostle Paul. Oh, we can't wait to hear from Brother Paul. And Paul got up and said, you are divided. You are living in immorality. 
you won't deal with sin. You're going to law with one another. And, I mean, went down the list. You're allowing all kinds of folks to speak in tongues and not following these patterns. I mean, he just went right down the list. And he's picturing this in his mind. And he says, was I too strong? Did I hit them too hard? You know, I'll be honest with you. I've preached some sermons before. And I've got done preaching. And I said, boy, I don't know where that came from. But I guess they needed it. <laughs> uh, maybe I needed it. Um, now, Paul wasn't just preaching. He was writing under inspiration of God. And as a human being, the human side of him said, boy, that sure was strong. But after all, God gave him the words. So he, he started second guessing. But then he got Titus. He said, Titus, I'm wondering how they're doing over at Corinth. I wrote him a pretty strong letter. I sure would like to think that it went well. I'd like to think they did some of those things. Would you go check on them? Titus makes a trip to Corinth. Paul can't go. Titus goes over, sees these people. Paul waits, he anticipates, and sure enough, Titus shows up and says, Paul, they got your letter, and I want you to know that they took it to heart. They as a church repented, and they told this man, they dealt with him just like you said, and lo and behold, he's even showing signs of repentance. The church responded right, the letter worked, and boy, what Paul says now, when I heard that, I had rejoicing in my heart. I was thrilled. You know why he was thrilled? He was thrilled because the Word of God did what it was supposed to do. Now, I notice the reprimand that he gives them. He talks a little bit about this reprimand in verse 9. He says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let's think a moment about this reprimand that Paul gave. You know, I could go back and we could look at that book in 1 Corinthians and we see some of the things that he said, but specifically about this incident, this man who had his father's wife, his stepmother, and uh, this was a terrible scandal in the church and the church hadn't got puffed up and he wrote literally and God gave him lead to say I judge as absent in body but present in spirit to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved he says you remove the protection of the local church from that man and let God be the judge let the devil have his uh, destruction of his flesh if he's a believer then his soul will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus I mean he came on strong now he came on strong and he said that the, that the, the, the preaching that he gave was not just to make them sorry he said I didn't write just to shake you up he said I wrote that you might sorrow to repentance you know I've, I've heard preachers before who got up and raked people over the coal and I agree to everything they said, but I mean some strong stuff. I'd say, well, what he's saying is biblical, but I almost cringed at the attitude of the preacher. He almost enjoyed getting on to him. I mean, he almost came across a little bit like, you know, you bunch of sorry, good-for-nothing human beings, which, you know what, we are a bunch of sorry, good-for-nothing human beings, but the preacher happened to be one too. You know, the thing is, hey, there are some strong things we need to say, but we've got to make sure when we do that our purpose is not just to get folks told, but to make sure we're preaching for godly sorrow. That's the point of preaching. That's the point of dealing with sin. It's not, hey, let me let you know how rotten you are and discourage you a little bit. You, hey, you've offended me. You know, you haven't offended me. I offend God myself, and you do too. We need to hear about it. Paul reprimanded them, and he said, look, I rejoiced not that you were made sorrow. You know, uh, there's no question when I was in evangelism, I used to joke with my wife about this a little bit. You start preaching in evangelism, of course, you, you're having a revival meeting. I used to tell her, I'd say, I had too many amens tonight. I'm going to try to shut them up tomorrow night if I can, you know. I need to hear some old me's. You know, everybody's amen. If you preach hard enough, it'll, they'll quieten things down. I heard about a, in fact, I got a friend who did this. A friend went and preached in uh, North Carolina. He was a, a college student. And he, he uh, had his little sermon that he would take off and preach at little churches. And it was a sermon on the conviction in Daniel 1.8. I mean, he, you know, had uh, Daniel purposed in his heart. And boy, he had that thing down, and he would go out and preach it. And I mean, he had everything in the book, you know, every conviction and standard. It was good, a good message, but it was based just, just kind of an application message. And he'd go off to this church and, you know, preach it, and he'd go to this church. Well, he went to a little country church, 
out in North Carolina, the mountains of North Carolina. And folks, those people knew how to shout and say hallelujah. And boy, I mean, everything you'd preach, they were right with you. Okay. He had never experienced that. He was from Chicago. People were a little more reserved. So he got to preaching along. And of course, you know, he started getting on the movies and he started getting on drinking or whatever it was. And I mean, he was getting, hey, amen. that's right, preacher. Shake that bush. I mean, you know, whatever it might have been. He was preaching along, and I mean, he was getting, that, that just stirred him up more. He got into it, kept right on preaching along, and he made the mistake of preaching on smoking. He didn't know you weren't supposed to preach on smoking in North Carolina. Son, he quietened that place right down, <laughs> and he knew time he said it. Man, what happened? The crickets are chirping here. And you know what his conclusion was? They need more preaching on smoking in North Carolina. Now, you understand, when you preach on sin and your purpose is, hey, we realize as Christians we're all in this thing together. We need to be told exactly where we stand. We need to hear it. I mean, uh, people will make comments sometimes about their toes getting stepped on, and yet we need to have our toes stepped on, don't we? But the purpose has always got to be that godly sorrow would bring repentance. Hey, God, I've, I've displeased you. I need to get right. And you know that's true as well. He's speaking to Christians here. But it's true as well, especially with lost people. For notice in verse 10, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know what the sorrow of the world is? I'm sorry for the consequences of my sin. You know, I've dealt with folks before who've come and responded with the sorrow of the world. You know, they've come forward, they realize... Uh, they're, they're not right, and they say, you know, I just need to get right today. Really, what's the problem? Well, I, I stole something, and now I'm going to jail. And I need, I've had people to, you know, come, and they knew they were going to court, and they knew where they were facing. Well, now, there's hope for them. Jesus will still save them, but they still have to go to jail if they, if they broke the law. But the more I talk with them, I'm just, they wanted a way out. I'm just looking a way to get out of jail. I mean, I, I know I've got this problem, and, that, and then I've had other people that wasn't that serious, but they said, look, I just don't like, you know, sin has given me a raw deal, and I realize I just need to give up this one sin. It, this is my problem. I just need a way to get help over drugs. Well, you do, but there's a deeper problem than just your drugs. You see, godly, or, or the sorrow of the world says, I don't want the consequences. And I, what can I do to get rid of these consequences? But godly sorrow worketh repentance. You know what repentance is directed at? I have offended a holy God. How can I get right with him? My sin is going to bring eternal judgment. How can I escape that judgment? Not just a temporal problem I want to escape. I want to get right with God, and that's what godly sorrow says. Now, you say in your mind, well, how are we going to differentiate that? Here's somebody sitting out here maybe tonight. You don't know Christ, and you're thinking, well, do I have godly sorrow, or do I have the sorrow of the world? Let me tell you who will clear it up for you, the Holy Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God touches your heart and you say, look, I know I have, been, I have offended a holy God. How can I get right with him? That's God working in your heart. And godly sorrow worketh repentance. Not to be repented of, the sorrow of the world, it comes short. Well, now Paul gave them this message and they preached. And then notice verse 12. He says, wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care of you in the sight of God might appear unto you. You know, no doubt there's an element when Paul wrote to this church. Sure, he had a heart. I'm sure he might even have known this man. He's likely he did. He wanted the man to get right with God. But you know, it's a pretty strong statement to say, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. No doubt there's a man here, think about this, we often overlook him. What about that boy's father? This man had taken his stepmother to wife and cheated on his own father. His father was greatly hurt in this too, wasn't he? Paul said, no doubt he had a heart and thought, man, that guy's got to be hurting over this. He probably doesn't even go to church. How could he if this has taken place? But he said, I didn't write just for that man to get right with God, nor did I write to encourage the one that it had been done to, but you know what his cause was first and foremost? Was the purity and the holiness of the church. He said, I wanted you to know my care over you. I was concerned about the state of the church because it was going to hurt it. You know, ultimately, what our first and foremost direction is. Yes, we want people to be helped. Yes, certainly we want souls to be saved. 
We want people to be encouraged, but I believe the cause of Christ is first and foremost. Hey, we make our decisions, our philosophy, our as a church, we go where we go, and we've got to decide first what pleases God. You know what we have today? A, a lot of the so-called churches that really have much compromise, that kind of throw biblical principles out the window. Hey, here's the way we're going to operate. We're just going to you know, do it the way we please. Because why? What is our motive? Ultimately, is the people. Ultimately, we want to help people. Ultimately, we want to get folks saved. Ultimately, we want to have more people come. It's better for them to at least come to this kind of church than it is to sit home and do nothing. And if you're based on the people, you might make a wrong decision. Now, the people are great. We ought to be interested in people. Don't misunderstand me. But what is our first motive? The cause of Christ. I got to obey him if nobody shows up. I've got to obey him if nobody wants to hear the gospel. But if I obey him, what can I depend on him to do? He can bring the people to, bring, to hear the gospel and let him work. So Paul said, this is why I wrote. Hey, his reprimand was effective. And then he says, therefore, we were comforted, as we said before. Yea, and exceeded the more joyed for the joy of Titus. In verse 14, if I've boasted anything of him, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. You know, what he said before, he said, I have no problem what I said about you folks before I bragged on you. And after listening to Titus, no doubt, there's still things that I can be encouraged about and how God has worked in your heart. And therefore, in verse 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. You know, sometimes we, uh, we hold people to a, to a lower standard than we even hold ourselves. That's really pride. That's really wrong for us to do it. But, you know, we look at somebody else and we think, well, I just don't know if they're really going to stick, stick with it. I don't know if they're going to grow as a Christian. I don't know if they're going to be faithful. I don't know if they're going to do what they ought. Well, if I think I would, why would I expect any less from them? Paul says, you know, I had a little, I didn't really know how you were going to take that. But I realize now I can rejoice that God is able to work in your heart just as much as he can work in anybody's. There is no hope in man. But there's so much hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that he can change and save and work and mold anybody. He can make the, the most cold Christian get his heart right with God and get on the straight and narrow. He can get a hold of the furthest sinner and change their life and make them new. God expects us. It's a process. It's a, it, it is a journey. It is an encouragement. It's an exhortation for us to be holy as individuals and to be holy as a church. And I trust he'll give us a heart to do it. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And Lord, we would ask you tonight to stir our hearts to perfect holiness in the fear of God. We know there's a, a great need for us to, to live a life that would be a testimony to this world. There could be some tonight who do not personally know the Lord Jesus Christ that need to be made holy on the inside through the blood of Christ. And those of us who do know you, Lord, would you do that process, that work in our life, to make us more like you. Lead now, we pray, in this invitation time, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing 515 tonight as an invitation song. Following our invitation song, our men are going to come and prepare for the Lord's Supper. So let's stand and sing 515 near the cross. If you don't know Christ tonight, you meet me here at the front, I'll have someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved. As a Christian, feel free to come find a place of prayer. Jesus. seated our men will come and prepare for the Lord's Supper 
As we prepare tonight for the Lord's Supper, it's always good for us to stop and consider what we're about to do. You know tonight that this bread that we take is a picture of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. At no time does this become the body of Christ, but he told us to do this in remembrance of his broken body. This cup reminds us of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that he shed. It doesn't become his blood. His blood, of course, was incorruptible. But it's a reminder of us tonight of what that significance of that blood is. God uses the term, the Lord's Supper. He also uses the term communion because it's a time of fellowship with God. You know, the Bible tells us if we walk in the light, as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another. It's always good at this point as we enter into this uh, to make sure our heart is prepared to do just that, to commune with the Lord. Now, we invite you tonight. We have many members here tonight. We have guests. Uh, we don't, you don't have to be a member of our church to participate in the Lord's Supper. But because it is communion and it is an ordinance, we do encourage only saved people. You have to be saved to be part of the communion. And baptism is the first act of obedience. So saved, baptized believers that are, as far as they know, walking in the light, are invited to be a part of our communion service. But before we enter into that service, we're going to take a moment of silent prayer, ask God to put us in a, a, a state of communion with him, and then, of course, we'll distribute the bread. So I'm going to ask our men to stand. I'm going to ask Virgil Zipper if he would give us a few minutes of silence, maybe a 30 seconds or so, and then if he'll have prayer for the bread before we distribute it. come tonight and thank you Lord for this opportunity we can come and partake of this Lord it represents the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ pray now Lord you would help us to examine our hearts Lord that we can partake of this worthily pray that you would help us to ask that you would forgive us Lord where we failed you yes. pray that as we partake of this Lord we'll ever be mindful Lord that you loved us enough that you would send your only begotten son to die mm. for us so Lord his blood was shed on the cross of Calvary thank you Lord now for what you've done Amen. 
Isaiah chapter 53, a very detailed chapter. Hundreds of years before Christ came to earth, his death was prophesied. And the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The chapter goes on to say, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him when he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. In verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The Lord, no doubt, was bruised and broken. We know the details of that. We know that his head had a crown of thorns that was placed into his scalp. We know that the Roman whip brought the flesh off of his back and put the stripes that were prophesied here. We know that the nails were placed in his hand. We know that his body was beaten, that his visage was more marred than any other man. And we don't uh, glory in the fact that Jesus had to suffer, but we thank God today that he did suffer because he didn't suffer just as a martyr. He suffered for our sin. The Bible's specific to say that it was by his stripes we are healed. He was bruised for our iniquities. And yet when the Lord saw that broken body and saw that uh, terrible ordeal that the Lord Jesus was to go through, all of my sin placed on him, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. As we take the bread, we are told by the Lord Jesus himself, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. I'm going to have our men stand and ask John Joe Salazar if he'll pray before we distribute the cup. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for your death on the cross, your burial, and your resurrection, Lord. We thank you that we do serve a risen Savior, Lord. And as we consider the cup that we're about to take part in, Lord, and consider the, uh, the agony that you suffered for our sakes, Lord, we just want to, as an assembly, be thankful. Lord, that you that you took our suffering for us. Yes. That you took that penalty of sin for us, so that we could escape uh, that death, Lord, one mm -hmm. day, and that we could live in heaven with you. Yes. Oh, we're so thankful for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And Lord, it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. 
1 John chapter 1, and verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Certainly every believer would have to look to the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and know that there is no sin too great, no person too far, no, no, uh, no transgression that God cannot clear and take care of through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he shed that blood on the cross, he made it possible for sinners to be reconciled to a holy God. His blood cleanses from all sin. But even as a believer today, we have to thank God for that blood that continually keeps me cleansed before the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us continually from all sin. God would have us remember tonight that blood of the New Testament which was shed for many for the remission of sin. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you tonight for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for his broken body. We know that tonight we do show the Lord's death till he come. We trust that our message tonight would encourage our heart, would challenge us, would cause us to go out to challenge a lost world with that very blessed truth that Jesus died for man's sin and man can be reconciled to God. May we be that ambassador. Thank you tonight for the great service. Thank you for the fellowship. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a stanza of a hymn, and that will dismiss us. 217, 217. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. 